Social Anarchism and Organization, Part 2, Social Anarchism, Class Struggle, and Center-Periphery Relations. Because, of anar because anarchism is an ideology which refuses to create new central systems with new peripheral areas. Rudolf de Jong. Anarchism is, for us, an ideology. This being a set of ideas, motivations, aspirations, values, a structure or system of concepts that has a direct connection with action, that which we call political practice. Ideology requires the formulation of final objectives, long-term, future perspectives, the interpretation of the reality in which we live, and a more or less approximate prognosis about the transformation of this reality. From this analysis, ideology is not a set of abstract values and ideas, dissociated from practice with a purely reflective character, but rather a system of concepts that exist in the way in which it is conceived together with practice and returns to it. Thus, ideology requires voluntary and conscious action with the objective of imprinting the desire for social transformation on society. We understand anarchism as an ideology that provides orientation for action to replace capitalism, the state, and its institutions with libertarian socialism, a system based on self-management and federalism, without any scientific or prophetic pretensions. Like other ideologies, anarchism has a history and specific context. It does not arise from intellectuals or thinkers detached from practice who pursued only abstract reflection. Anarchism has a history which developed within the great class struggles of the 19th century when it was theorized by Proudhon and took shape in the midst of the International Workers Association with the work of Bakunin, Guillaume, Reclus, and others who advocated revolutionary socialism in opposition to reformist legalist, or statist socialism. This tendency of the IWA was later known as federalist, or anti-authoritarian, and found its continuity in the militancy of Kropotkin, Malatesta, and others. Thus, it was within the IWA that anarchism took shape, quote, in the direct struggle of the workers against capitalism from the needs of the workers from their aspirations to freedom and equality that lived particularly in the masses of workers in the most heroic times." End quote. The work of theorizing anarchism that was done by thinkers and workers who were directly involved in social struggles and who helped to formalize and disseminate the sentiment that was latent in what they called the mass movement. Thus, over the years, anarchism developed theoretically and practically. On the one hand, it contributed in a unique way to episodes of social transformation, maintaining its ideological character, such as, for example, in the Mexican Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Spanish Revolution, or even in Brazilian episodes, like the General Strike of 1917 and the Insurrection of 1918. On the other hand, in certain contexts, anarchism assumed certain characteristics that retreated from the ideological character, transforming it into an abstract concept, which became merely a form of critical observation of society. Over the years, this model of anarchism assumed its own identity, finding references in history and at the same time losing its character of the struggle for social transformation. This was more strikingly evident in the second half of the 20th century. Thought of from this perspective, anarchism ceases to be a tool of the exploited in their struggle for emancipation and functions as a hobby, a curiosity, a theme for intellectual debate, an academic niche, an identity, a group of friends, etc. For us, this view seriously threatens the very meaning of anarchism. This disastrous influence on anarchism was noted and criticized by various anarchists from Malatesta when he polemicized with the individualists 
that were against organization, to Luigi Fabri, who made his critique of the bourgeois influences on anarchism already in the early 20th century, up to Murray Bookchin, who in the mid-1990s noted this phenomenon and tried to warn, quote, unless I am very wrong, and I hope to be, the social and revolutionary objectives of anarchism are suffering the attrition of reaching a point where the word anarchy becomes part of the elegant bourgeois vocabulary of the next century. Disobedient, rebellious, carefree, but delightfully harmless. End quote. We advocate that anarchism recaptures its original ideological character, or as we previously defined it, a system of concepts that has a direct connection with action of political practice. Seeking to recapture this ideological character and to differentiate ourselves from other currents in the broad camp of contemporary anarchism, we advocate social anarchism and therefore corroborate the criticisms of Malatesta and Fabry and affirm the dichotomy identified by Bookchin that there is today a social anarchism returning to struggles with the objective of social transformation and a lifestyle anarchism that renounces the proposal for social transformation and involvement in the social struggles of our time. For us, social anarchism is a type of anarchism that as an ideology seeks to be a tool of social movements and the popular organization with the objective of overthrowing capitalism and the state and of building libertarian socialism, self-managed and federalist. To this end, it promotes the organized return of anarchists to the class struggle with the goal of recapturing what we call the social vector of anarchism. We believe that it is among the exploited classes, the main victims of capitalism, that anarchism is able to flourish. If, as Nino Vasco put it, we have to throw the seeds of anarchism on the most fertile terrain. This terrain is for us the class struggle that takes place in popular mobilizations and in, class, and in social struggles. Seeking to oppose social anarchism with lifestyle anarchism, Bookchin asserted that, quote, social anarchism is radically at odds with an anarchism which focuses on lifestyle the neo-situationist invocation of ecstasy in the increasingly contradictory sovereignty of the petty bourgeois ego. The two diverge completely in their defining principles, socialism or individualism." End quote. Commenting on the title of his book, Anarchismo Social, Social Anarchism, Frank Mintz, another contemporary militant and thinker, emphasized, quote, this title should be useless because the two terms are implicitly linked. It is likewise misleading because it suggests that there may be a non-social anarchism outside of struggles, end quote. In this way, we understand that social anarchism is necessarily implicated in the class struggle. Within our vision of social anarchism as, quote, a fundamental tool for the support of daily struggles, end quote, we also need to clarify our definition of class. While considering the class struggle as central and absolutely relevant in society today, we understand that the Marxists, by choosing the factory worker as the unique historic subject of the revolution, despise all other categories of the exploited classes while also potentially revolutionary subjects. The authoritarian's conception of the working class, which is restricted only to the category of industrial workers, does not cover the reality of relations of domination and exploitation that have occurred throughout history, and even the relationships that occur in this society. Just as it does not cover the identification of revolutionary subjects of the past and present, Starting from the need to clarify this conception of class, we include in the camp of the exploited classes, which can and should contribute to the process of social transformation by means of class struggle, other categories that have in large part received the attention 
of anarchists throughout history. This definition of the conception of class does not change the class struggle as the main terrain for the action of social anarchism, but offers a different way of seeing our goal, the transformation of center-periphery relations, or more specifically, the transform transformation of the relations of domination of the peripheries by the centers, based on the classification of Rudolf de Jung. And on our own recent history of struggle, we conceptualize all the exploited classes starting from the center-periphery relations. Thus, taking part in this group are a. Cultures and societies completely estranged and distanced from the center, not at all integrated and savage in the eyes of, of the center, for example, the Indians of the Amazon b. Peripheral areas related to the center and belonging to its socio-economic and political structures that attempt, at the same time, to maintain their identities. They are dominated by the center, threatened in their existence by the economic expansion thereof, by the standards of the center they, they are backwards and underdeveloped. For example, the indigenous communities of Mexico and the Andean countries. Other examples in this category, perhaps we should talk of a subgroup, B1, are small farmers, skilled workers, and peasants threatened in their social and economic existence by the progress of the center and who still struggle for their independence. C, economic classes or socioeconomic systems that used to belong to the center but returned to a peripheral position after technological innovations and socioeconomic developments in the center. For example, the lumpen proletariat, precarious informal workers, and the permanent army of the unemployed. D. Social classes and groups that take part in the center in an economic sense, but that are peripheral in a social cultural, and or political sense. The working classes, the proletariat in emerging industrial societies, women, blacks, homosexuals. E. Center periphery relations of a political nature, whether between states or within them. Colonial or imperialist relations, capital versus provincial relations, etc. Such relations in the capitalist system are developed in parallel with the economic relations mentioned above or group E1, neo-capitalist domination, internal colonialization and exploitation. Accepting this classification and being conscious of its limitations, we define the category of exploited classes as the peripheral areas that are dominated by the center. It is important to stress that we do not consider as part of this set of exploited classes individuals who are in theory in peripheral areas, but that in practice establish relations of domination over others, thus becoming new centers. Hence the need for all the struggles of the exploited classes to have a revolutionary perspective in order that they do not seek simply to make parts of the peripheral areas constituted into new centers. Proceeding from this definition, there are two ways of thinking about social transformation. One, authoritarian, historically used by the heirs of Marxism, revolutionary or reformist, and another, libertarian, used by the anarchists. Authoritarians, including some who call themselves anarchists, Think of the center as a means and orient their politics towards it. For them, the center, considering this to be the state, the party, the army, the position of control, is an instrument for the emancipation of society. And, quote, the revolution means, in the first place, the capturing of the center and its power structure, or the creation of a new center, end quote. The authoritarian's very conception of class is based on the center, 
when defining the industrial proletariat as a historical subject, which is described in the letter D in the definition cited above, and excludes and marginalizes other categories of the exploited classes that are in the periphery, like, for example, the peasantry. Libertarians do not think of the center as a means and struggle permanently against it, building their revolutionary model and their strategy of struggle in the direction of all the peripheries, explained by the letters that go from A to E in the definition above. That is, in its activity in the class struggle, anarchism considers as elements of the exploited classes traditional communities, peasants, unemployed, underemployed, homeless, and other categories are frequently overlooked by the authoritarians. Quote, thus the struggle would be taken up by someone who really feels the effects of the system and therefore needs urgently to abolish it. End quote. Anarchists stimulate social movements in the periphery from the grassroots and seek to build a popular organization in order to combat in solidarity the existing order and create a new society that would be based on equality and freedom in which classes would no longer make sense. In this struggle, anarchists utilize the means that contain within themselves the germs of the future society. Quote, the anarchist conception of the social forces behind social change is much more general than the Marxist formula. Unlike Marxism, it does not afford a specific role to the industrialized proletariat. In anarchist writings, we find all kinds of workers and poor, all the oppressed, all those that somehow belong to the peripheral groups or areas and are therefore potential factors in the revolutionary struggle for social change. With this conception of revolutionary forces, we affirm that, ev that quote, Everything indicates that it is in the periphery, in the margins, that the revolution keeps its flame alight, end quote. Therefore, our conclusion is that anarchism has to be in permanent contact with the peripheries in order to seek out its project of social transformation. <laughs>